Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Posey Parker. She's a UK accidental activist and founder of Standing for Women. So first off, thank you for your work in the world. And second, thank you for being on the program. You're welcome. Hi. So my first question is, uh, can you define woman and, and, and then we'll go from there? Uh, yeah, very simply, uh, it's an adult human female and that's it. So you, you recently, uh, were part of or were behind a, a billboard campaign in the UK. Can you, can you tell me about that, that billboard campaign? Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, we've been talking about the GRA in the United Kingdom for quite some time, and the GRA is the Gender Recognition Act. I think it's very similar to your Equality Act. So what that seeks to do, um, very many layers actually. Some of them are things like reduce the age that somebody can legally change sex. Um, it also uh, will allow anybody to self-identify. So they won't have to go through what is commonly amusingly called uh, sort of a harrowing ordeal, which is basically turning up to a GP and uh, maybe a psychotherapist and get them to agree that you have gender dysphoria. Um, and clearly that is uh, incredibly harrowing. Uh, on what level, I have no idea. So um, I decided that what was really important – so. It, at, to, to reverse just a little bit, so the GRA thing, everybody was focused on it. Uh, on it, it seemed to be a real uh, point at which people galvanised, formed groups, and so on. And actually, I thought it was overall a very small part of a very nasty, dangerous, odious picture um, and and misogynist cloud that was just falling over the UK. So what I wanted to do is I wanted the average Joe, so not people already like myself who've been invested in this for sort of four years, um, and many people who already decided their position on trans rights and um, using the, the mistaken sort of slogans that trans rights are human rights, as if anybody had ever disputed that. Uh, and they seemed to... Very cleverly, they'd already convinced the public that trans were like the next frontier of civil rights and so on. So I wanted to bring into the open the fact that it was a misogynistic movement and it was vile and it was mainly an attack on women by men. And so I started selling T-shirts in order to raise enough money to do something and I thought I thought I was going to advertise in like the Times and that was about £40,000. I thought that was a bit steep and, and I didn't have until the next millennium to sell enough t-shirts to raise the cash. So I looked at billboards and unlike the USA, billboards in the UK are relatively cheap. Um, at the same time, uh, these, uh, penis stickers had gone out which said women, uh, don't have penises in the shape of a penis and somebody had stuck them all over a beach, uh, in Liverpool. And that was on the basis that somebody had created this whole movement in London of women don't have penises, a very good friend of mine who will remain nameless. Um, and then it, uh, so Liverpool became a little bit of a focus. And I was like, right, I'll do the, I'll do the billboard in Liverpool. And it also happened to be the Labour Party conference. So the billboard went up and it was all a little bit quiet for a week. And then this nasty uh, doctor called Adrian Harrop. Wait, wait, wait. What did the billboard say? Oh, so, I'm so sorry. It said woman, and then the phonetic woman, um, noun, adult human female, in black and white. That's it. That's what it said. Yeah, I think it may have had my web address, which is standingforwomen.com, and it may have had a hashtag, GRA consultation. But, uh, then, but, that was but the, 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 the actual substance of the thing was simply the dictionary definition of woman. Absolutely. And uh, clearly it was deeply offensive to... <laughs> many grown men and it got removed uh, so they, a few trans activists um, kicked up some baby tantrums complained to Prime Site which also is a global uh, billboard, a media owner and they took it down and issued a disgusting statement about how they should have noticed when it went through copy, it should have been a red flag, that this was potentially like a terrible thing um, and I don't have the statement to hand, but it basically 
it, the upshot was that it was hate speech and it was disgusting and it was offensive and it shouldn't be up. And so they took it down in seconds. So, so, so I, I sort of have two directions I would like to go here. So, so I'm going to ask two questions and you can answer them in any order or skip one of them or whatever. And one of them is, is, so, so they essentially declared the dictionary defin- definition of woman to be hate speech. And the other direction is just that, that strikes me as really extraordinary. And the other direction is, uh, without being, without being sarcastic or undercutting, <laughs> intentionally undercutting, can you give their bar- very best argument for why this would be hate speech? Cause it seems to be nonsensical. Okay. So if I can, yeah, uh, how do I, justify it being hate speech in their eyes i i think because they immediately saw it as exclusionary so by asserting that woman is adult human female it automatically excludes men who call themselves women so that's that would make uh according to adrian harrop that would make trans women uh feel unsafe in when they're walking around liverpool the dictionary definition of woman would make grown men feel unsafe uh, so uh, uh, that's it I mean hate speech I think is a nonsense anywhere I have absolutely no time for, for any concept of hate speech I think it's a, a, a nonsense but if your entire existence is reliant upon the notion that men can be women and a woman will just say no you know complete sentence no uh, men cannot be women, then I guess your sort of shaky foundations will, you know, the, the house you built on shaky foundations will just crumble, won't they? So what are the, now let's move to the other half of that. And the, it, it strikes me as extraordinary that um, a dictionary definition, in, in fact, a biological definition that has what really millions of years of history that you know an adult female is an adult female um, mm-hmm. it, it, it strikes me as extraordinary that that is declared to be hate speech or that that is declared to be offensive or I guess I guess let's step away from from women's rights for a moment and talk about discourse what what are the effects uh, oh wait let's not go there instead i just recently read a newspaper account about a woman who was wearing a shirt that said woman equals adult human female and she was kicked out of a pub for being yeah. offensive so so it's not just billboards but this is like all around uh discourse within within the uk right Absolutely. That's my T-shirt. That's the T-shirt that I sell that she was kicked out of the pub for wearing. So <laughs> it's um, it's very neat. And but I mean, it it is shocking, Derek. But honestly, I knew this would happen. I, I did it because I knew it would happen. I knew this would provoke this response. You know, it wasn't an accident that I put a dictionary dish, d- definition of woman on a billboard and then some people made a fuss. I knew they would make a fuss. That's where we are in the UK. And so if you knew they would make a fuss, so so why did you do it? Because I wanted to bring into the public consciousness what is happening. Because a lot of people are absolutely unaware. Uh, the GRA, so the change to the Gender Recognition Act, uh, which was going to allow self-ID, that was going to go very quietly, just slip through uh, Parliament without telling anyone. Our laws have been changed from the word sex to gender all over the place. This has just been happening with no consultation, uh, no permission from anybody, no vested, you know, groups that have vested interest in, in these laws or will be impacted by these laws. Nobody's been consulted. It's, it's quite, it's very eerie um, and sinister that such seismic changes can be it can have been happening for the last 20 years without anybody noticing so in order to do that i had to create a new story because i couldn't really afford to advertise in newspapers 
So I had to create a new story and that's, that's what I did. It had to come, you know, it had to be John that goes to work on a building site all day. He doesn't know that his daughter is going to go swimming and she no longer has any right to privacy in a swimming pool and a bloke could be in her changing room. So he's the guy that I needed to tell. I needed to tell, you know, the, the parents that send their kids to school that schools have trans inclusion policies. And in order to do that, I just needed to bring this word into the open um, and show that even the word woman has become transphobic. And the, the reason I know that is because uh, we have a cervical cancer charity, and when they released the material all about cervical cancer, the word woman did not appear once. Not once. They called us cervix havers. So this, this sort of erosion, this nasty misogynist erosion, because testicular cancer still very much talks about men cupping their testicles and making sure they don't have lumps. But for women, we our body parts are not allowed to be part of women. They just have to be their standalone body parts so that both trans women and trans men are not offended. So what has been the response? If you get out of academia and out of uh, the sort of mainstream media, what is the response to your work by the people you are attempting to reach, by the the... the the sort of person on his way to work who has a daughter or a typical mother or just regular people? It's, it's really good. It's, uh, you know, it's, I got off the train in London and I'm five foot one and I have peroxide blonde hair and I wear quite a lot of makeup, probably too much. Um, and so I think I'm relatively recognizable. You know, if you see me once, you, you probably would recognize this small, <laughs> small you know woman and uh i've been recognized you know by train drivers and i was in my local supermarket the other day and i'm not very well known when we live because we haven't lived here very long um and a guy just came up and said thank you so much which is peculiar but that is why i'm doing it um and it's it's gone in the news i did uh, a sky interview after the billboard it did go a bit media crazy uh, in, you know, in, in my terms of somebody that hasn't really done anything except raise her children for the last 17 years. Uh, and I was on Sky News against Adrian Harrop. And, you know, people have responded overwhelmingly, uh, fantastic. I get lots and lots of letters from all over the world. You know, not just, there's, some of them are heartbreaking of people who are, um, domestic violence survivors or, uh, child sex abuse survivors and they write to me and they they just say it's finally it's nice to finally be able to speak about this stuff because they've noticed it for years so i think the man on the street i think it has had the impact this t-shirt pub barring um story has gone in all the newspapers that your, your average joe is reading you know, if they're still, if they're, if they're still reading a newspaper, they're reading the Daily Mail, um, and the Sun and the Mirror. These are quick, easy tabloid newspapers. And all of those have, have run with this story. And I think it's getting kicked out of your local pub as a, a perfect story for the UK for wearing a woman t-shirt. I mean, it couldn't encapsulate what's happening, uh, more perfectly, really. In, in terms of, I mean, as, obviously in terms of the definition of woman, but also in terms of, the larger story of kicking women out of public spaces. Mm. But also a pub in the UK, you know, it's, it probably doesn't have the, um, it isn't the center of things like it used to be. You know, everyone has, has a local in the UK. People do go for a pint. People, you know, we are, we probably drink a little bit too much over here, but it's a, it's a thing that people do on a Friday at five o'clock when they finish work. They go and have a quick pint in the pub. And so it's quite an important place for people in the UK. And let's face it, I mean, if if being offended um, or being very um, open to being offended, a pub isn't the best place to go because it's full of, it's it's often full of people that have had too much to drink, too much to drink. So um, it, it's just perfect. The, the the pub is a you know the the pub is like a bar, so it's a perfect place. And as for as 
to the public space, um, it's, it's, it's just completely insane. But it is women that are being attacked. It's not men. Nobody's asking a man to leave a pub. You know, for wearing a, an offensive t-shirt. You know, if he had a, if he had a t-shirt with a naked woman with some breasts and a woman said to the barman, look, that I find that really offensive and upsetting, we'd probably get told to shut up. Well, I was just thinking about that, that if, that's another extraordinary part of this is that, um, people are getting kicked out for, she's getting kicked out, a woman's getting kicked out for this being offensive, the billboard gets taken down for this being offensive. I swear, if I got, if I went to the owner of every place where one of the customers was wearing a t-shirt I found offensive, I would never go anywhere. Um, yeah, we'd well, never be off back, would you? There's, there's a, I, I, I can think off the top of my, I mean, this is probably way too graphic, but I remember standing in the line at the post office and a guy in front of me had a shirt on that had, and he, the shirt said butt man, and then it had all sorts of, uh, stencil drawings of, uh, a man having anal intercourse with a woman. Jesus. Like, and I have to say, I put on my big boy undies and dealt. You know, I didn't, I didn't go screaming that this is incredibly offensive, even though that actually was offensive. <laughs> yeah. I didn't that get kicked out of the post offensive. office. No. <laughs> you allowed him to get on with his day and post his mail. Exactly. Exactly. And then I complain about him to you, which I, <laughs> which I think is what we're supposed to do. Um, it is. But the entitlement of being able to tell a woman that a T-shirt with the definition of woman is offensive, the entitlement just astounds me. How dare anybody tell women that the definition of what they are um, that has existed, as you say, for such a long time is now suddenly offensive. It's just, it, it's, it's mind boggling. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever, except if we accept that all these men are absolute misogynist bastards. So let's talk for a moment about, uh, you have done some videos about, uh, something called, quote, transing children. Mm-hmm. So, so I, I'm going to say something here that, that many people in the United States will consider really offensive, which is that I find it extraordinary that, um, that, that a teenage male in the United States has had his genitals removed publicly and mm-hmm. this is celebrated as wonderful and courageous. I find it horrifying that a teen ha- that a teen who did not have testicular cancer or you know some other terrible uh the, the the perfectly healthy genitals were removed from a teenager and we are not recoiling in horror well we're in a new age of homophobia aren't we where these effeminate boys are considered you know that that are there's an expression over here that the CEO of Mermaids, who actually I've got to go for a police interview uh, next week because uh, she's complained about me because I talk about um, her and her charity in my videos. And she she says, I'd rather have a live daughter than a dead son. And I think what that really means is I'd rather have a daughter than a gay son. Um, that's... In my mind, I cannot, I cannot fathom thinking, I know what I'm going to do. My son likes to wear dresses. So now we're going to follow that through. So instead of him being a boy in a dress, we're going to say that he's a girl in a dress in the wrong body and his penis is superfluous to his requirements. So when he's 11, we're going to stick him on some pu- puberty blockers. That's going to, um, completely inhibit his body to go through a normal puberty, which we don't really know what the connection is with puberty and our brains and our social thing i'm pretty bloody sure that evolution has designed our puberty and adolescence pretty damn well and i think it's quite significant that we go through puberty at that time because of all the other stuff we're still under the care of our parents we get to make ridiculous mistakes as teenagers without too much responsibility for them um 
you know, there, there are tribes where the boys go off with the dads for sort of 14 to 16 for two years and become men. You know, it's a really important, it's a globally important time. It's, an, it's a developmental uh, phenomenon that is not cultural. You know, the, all cultures go through very similar feelings uh, throughout their adolescence, which is they feel embarrassed about their bodies. They become more sensitive and distant from parents. Their peers become really important, which is why even though kids know they'll get cancer if all their friends smoke, they're going to smoke. Um, and, and this is, they've now found that during adolescence, your brain makes more changes than from naught to three. So it's not just this time that you can pause and pick up. But I can't imagine them thinking, well, by the time my son is 17, and I, I will be graphic, so I apologize to your listeners, they will never have an erection. They will never have a libido. They will never have a sexual thought or feeling about anything. And so we are saying to that child, what is more important is that you look like the sex that we've decided that we think you might be born in the wrong body. You're going to look like that, but you will never, ever feel anything sexual. And without wanting to, you know, go into sort of personal things, I think most adults who've had any amount of intimacy or feelings for anyone at any point would say that a life without uh, the capability of having sex would be a life not quite so valuable it's i think it's absolutely disgusting i'm i'm i blame stupidity of parents and i'm sorry but the whole world could tell me that that would be the right thing for for me to do to my child and i intuitively know that it's grotesque abuse and i really i I really have no and the doctors that make fun, uh, money from it i can't wait till they're sued until they have um as we'd say in the uk not a pot to piss in so that that's my very mild view about the situation. I think, I mean, I, the notion of not having, um, <laughs> the, the notion of, of losing one's genitals, um, especially before one has been able to experience sexuality brings tears to my eyes. It's so, it's so vile, isn't it? It's just the most grotesque child abuse imaginable. How dare anybody do that to those children? And if you're a girl and you go on puberty blockers, you get something called vi vagina, uh, vaginal atrophy. And what that basically does is all, you know, the vagina is an, an incredible thing, um, self-cleaning, self-lubricating, all these wonderful things. That stops. So what happens to these girls is they end up in excruciating pain. And when they eventually go on to cross-sex hormones, when they're probably 16, I don't know what age it is in the States, but over here I think it's 16. Um, when they do have orgasms, which I can't, I don't think can happen. I don't think there's enough children that we know that have taken puberty blockers that then go on to cross-sex hormones. There's not enough data to... Uh, for me to positively assert this, but there is absolutely no data to say that I'm wrong either. Uh, so either way, it's a bad thing. But they end up in excruciating agony because those muscles, very cleverly, when a woman orgasms... Am I all right to be this graphic? Absolutely. Okay. So when a woman orgasms and, and everything tightens up, it releases and it's, you know, it's a, it's a muscle and it's very clever and it knows what it's doing. It doesn't release if you've had testosterone. It no longer releases. And the only long-term solution to that, and it could, it could take five minutes, an hour, or days of being, you know, kind of a cramp in a place that you can't touch. Um, and so a lot of these girls then have hysterectomies. So you really are saying to that girl that you give puberty blockers at 11, you really are saying that she will end up with a hysterectomy. She may also have necros where her skin dies on her thigh, where her forearm is removed to make a penis that will never work. And so the entire flesh of her forearm is taken to create a phallus that will never... I mean, it, of course it won't work. I mean, I'm not a man, but I have a funny feeling that my forearm is slightly less sensitive than a man's penis. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not... <laughs> I'm I can... not... 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. 
I can I can verify. <laughs> um, yeah, I've I've heard that argument that well, yes, they still have they still have nerves there and they can still have sensations, but and okay, this is as graphic as we're going to get, and then we're going to back away I, from the graphicness. Yeah, that, that if no 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 no, this is not you. I'm going to say this that there is a difference between someone, myself, or anyone else stroking my forearm and stroking some other mm-hmm. place. And yeah, of course. That's those those nerves are not the same. Well, and, evolution and, and, is a fundamental thing, isn't it? it we've, our bodies have been designed to do the the fundamental thing that furthers our species. That's what whether we whether we choose to do that or not is another matter. Whether our brains feel like we want to do that is also another matter. But fundamentally, our bodies are designed to procreate. And one of those things will be the willingness to do that. And so obviously it, these things work in our favor to ensure that we actually procreate. It, I, oh, I, I just can't imagine doing that to my child. And for what? For woke points? Um, like I said earlier, the, the only, the only, the only reasons I can think of to lose my genitals would be to save my life in terms of, you know, some horrific cancer. Um, yeah. and then I would still be very sad. Absolutely. So, <laughs> so, so one of the arguments that I hear made, um, when, when, Anyone, man or woman, says that woman equals adult human female, and then female equals the sex that produces eggs, or, you know, we can, we can mm-hmm. define that, you know, whatever specific, you can define it chromosomally, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the arguments I hear from the other side that in, infuriates me is, oh, oh, like, or when, they, when, you, when you say, well, first off, I'm gonna back up, that the stickers, women don't have penises, I cannot believe we live in a culture where that is a controversial statement. I find that extraordinary. And <laughs> second, I know it's like we have yeah. to explain to adults where babies come from. And but second, so one of the counter arguments that the other side makes when somebody says women don't have penises, a counter argument they make is, "Oh, you are reducing women to their genitals." So can you can you respond to that that counter argument? Yeah, it's a very, um, it's a sort of a gotcha argument, isn't it? But that's ludicrous because human beings have two legs. Now, if a man's got one leg, it doesn't mean I'm reducing him to his legs because I say human has two legs. So unfortunately, uh, not all women have babies, but only women can. So that's, you know, not all women have fully functional, f- fertile bodies. Uh, that can produce offspring, but only women do have them. I think some people don't understand the notion of subsets. <laughs> well. So, so let's, you said that this has been happening for 20 years. Can you give a little bit of the history? Uh, yeah, so the Gender Recognition Act was 2004. Uh, prior to that, we had uh, transsexuals, uh, male to female, uh, they've been asking questions in our parliament. We have a written record called Hansard and there's evidence, you know, back at, as far as like the early nineties where people were saying, where should we put these transsexuals? Uh, and the, the work's been going on behind the scenes for such a long time. I, it really is the only way to explain what's happened and, and they've done it very covertly there's there's been nothing you know if this was okay and if everybody was going to find these brand new developments and changing everything to gender and how one feels if they didn't if the people that have forced these changes didn't think the public were going to uh, say no they wouldn't have been so secretive about what they were achieving what, what they were aiming to achieve and that's what it is. In the 2004 legislation, um, there's some really loose terms. Now, one of the terms in the uh, Gender Recognition Act, which enabled uh, people to marry, that's essentially what it was because we had no uh, equal marriage. And so in order to get over that for people that had changed sex, 
And it's all to do with the bloody European Court of Human Rights. And for those males that had changed to females who then wanted to marry males, they used uh, human rights legislation to say that they had a right to a married and family and private life. So that's how it all came about, that that was pushed through for these very small number of men that had changed to women and vice versa because the one of the people that has led the charge is a, a woman called Stephen Whittle who has presented as a man for a really long time. And he wanted to, she wanted to marry a woman. And obviously you couldn't do that in 2004 in the UK. We didn't allow um, people to, uh, homosexuals to marry. And so that's, that's what it's about. But we have really fundamental objections, which is you cannot inherit a title by transition. What that essentially means is uppity women who decide that they want their hands on their inherited land and title they cannot transition to be the oldest male in the family so it's very very uh, the upper echelons of our society so um the aristocracy if one of them dies there and they're landed gentry then their title will go to the next living male relative and sometimes that's been like a seventh cousin in spain so you cannot transition to be that male to get that money and that title. And the other one is that the Church of England do not have to recognise a transsexual male as a woman, uh, which will mean that they don't have to marry them. They don't have to have them in church and let them get married. So they don't think it really. You know, you can't have exceptions in law and then still say that trans women are women. That makes no sense. Um. I know I'm really getting out of my own lane here since I'm talking about the UK and I don't know anything about the UK, but if, if, if it's a problem of it goes to the male heir and, but they don't want to make it so the, the, the women can become men, which of course they can't, why don't they just make it so the women can inherit the land? Oh, good gracious, no. We've only just enabled, uh, so when, uh, Catherine, which is William. So our royalty goes Queen Elizabeth, then the next on the throne is Prince Charles, and then his son is Prince William. William is married to Catherine, and only when she was pregnant did they change it, that if she had a girl first, that that girl could be queen, even if she went on to have boys, because it's always been the male heir to the throne. So, you know, so that seems a really good transition to, you mentioned early on and a, a couple times that you thought that this was, uh, fundamentally a misogynist movement. Mm -hmm. And can you talk explicitly about what, um, can you talk about explicitly about, uh, female erasure and the erosion of female spaces? Well, it's very clever, this new attack on women's rights, and it's, it's all by the back door. You know, the, the, the wolf has basically come in a very pretty sheep's clothing. Uh, and what better way to completely end the right of women to gather without men, which is that men now say they are women. And these are cross-dressers. These people haven't even made an effort. You know, these are truckers in a dress. Um, it's, <laughs> It's quite, I mean, it is, a, it is astounding. It is laughable. You know, I, I don't even, I don't even know anymore if I believe in gender dysphoria because I think gender is, gender is not a physical thing. Therefore, how can you be dysphoric about societal expectations? It, you might have dysphoria around, um, what your genitals look like maybe or what your body shape looks like. But to, to say that you have a psychological issue, about the role you are expected to play in society when all you bloody well have to do is just not play it. Um, so I think the only answer for me is, is the fetish. So I mean, it's, I just, I, for, for a man to cycle, I know Graham talked about this, so I'll, I'll gloss over it quite quickly, but for that guy to cycle in a race and beat women, for, um, a man to think it's okay, like, not give a shit about going into a changing room where he knows he makes women feel uncomfortable. I mean, that's just, that's a new realm of misogyny, isn't it? Just, it, it's, I'd rather have a guy who doesn't think I know what a car engine is and call me love and dear 
and stare at my breasts. I'd rather have that than a man who thinks he can come into my changing room and me treat him as a woman. That's that's where I am in my... I'm, abs- I'm so incensed by these men who, you know, and then silence women with all these clever little tactics of calling us, uh, giving us power that we've never had. These men telling us that we have cis privilege and that we have some sort of power. And I think what they really mean is that, that they want our bodies and they they hate us because they are not us, because they have become obsessed. Uh, I was reading a, an account of a guy who transitioned and he talks about, I mean, it's, it's so hysterical. It, it's funny. So he, he talks about, um, A, he called himself Mindy, which I think is a suitably porny, porny girl next door from childhood, like Mork and Mindy. There's something quite yucky about that anyway, that he called himself Mindy. But then he talks about um, as soon as he became Mindy and put on women's clothes, he had a whole new persona um, and mannerisms and talk differently. And he felt he could now listen to Beyonce. Um, and then he stopped having sex with his partner, although I'm sure it must, it probably was her choice. But he said he stopped having sex with his partner because he just had such a good time taking selfies of himself. I mean, it's, and these people are saying it. They're not ashamed. <laughs> They're telling people as if it's some sort of brave and courageous frontier that they've just got through. It, you know, it's, that misogyny. It's the misogyny that says all I need to do to be a woman is, is stick some silicon fillers in a bra, um, slightly cock my head so you can't really see my Adam's apple, put on a dodgy looking wig, loads of makeup, and, and talk like a, the sort of, um, way that prostitutes were, uh, portrayed in the film Police Academy back in the 1980s. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, if it wasn't so sinister, it would be hilarious. You know, earlier you said that gender is just social expectations. And that's one of the things that has sort of blown me away about this whole thing is maybe a year and a half ago, I was, I was thinking about this and I suddenly realized that gender is all just crap. And mm. the reason I realized it's crap is because, of course, when people talk about gender, what they're really talking about is, as you said, stereotypes projected onto the sex mm. so that, you know, a woman is supposed to like frilly clothes and, and not like, and, and a man is not supposed to like Beyonce or however you say her name. And see, I'm a guy, so I don't even know how to say her name. That's how manly I am. Oh, you're yeah, so manly. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so that, that it's, it, it suddenly occurred to me that, if we were to talk about this in terms of race, what we would be talking about, we wouldn't come up with a fancy word that you could use at a university, but instead you talk about race stereotypes. Mm. Or you talk about um, uh, even national stereotypes. Mm. And if somebody doesn't fit the British national stereotype, I mean, the stereotype of somebody from Britain, I'm going to say as somebody completely ignorant, never been there, is, uh, let's see, you like fish and chips? <laughs> and uh what else uh you mentioned liverpool so you probably like the beatles but that's probably passe um i don't know what else what else oh and you worship the queen okay mm. so i happen to like fish and chips and uh the beatles are okay and let's say i like the queen so does that make me now british because I, my gender is brit my 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 country gender is british i think that makes you national neutral <laughs> or, or maybe fluid, you know, cause sometimes I don't actually, I don't, sometimes I don't like the Beatles. So it's like I, I, I I'm fluid. I flow back and forth. Yeah. You're, yeah, absolutely. And, and so my, my point is that, that we recognize how crazy this is if we say, okay, you know, there, there are racial stereotypes of, you know, African American people like certain things or they do certain things and, if I were to say that because I like to play basketball, that that makes me somehow, uh, we would all recognize how incredibly offensive that is. Well, at the same, the same people that dress as women will, uh, uh, they had a go at that girl, didn't they, for wearing the Chinese dress to a prom. 
And the outrage about that girl wearing the dress that was a traditional Chinese dress. I mean, I've been to China. My parents used to live there, so I've been there many times. And the one thing the Chinese used to do every summer that I went uh, with my children when they were very small is they wanted me to do these photo shoots. So in the end, I did. And they dress you like a traditional Chinese woman, and you have to have the poses, and your head have to it has to be just so, and you have to wear the fake nails, and you have to hold your hands and put your little finger up and all this stuff. Um, and I'm pretty sure that if anybody saw those photos they'd accuse me of cultural appropriation but those same people would not give a crap about Caitlyn Jenner um trying on his kids clothes when they were out to see how they felt and uh now transitioning supposedly into what he thinks is a woman you know the, the same people hold those two ideas simultaneously and then when you when you confront them about that they will say but they're different and then you say how are they different and they will say, you're a bigot and you need to die. It's so weird because sex is actually different, whereas race isn't. You know, race is um, inherited genes. You know, if you talk to any biologist, there is one human race. You know, the the notion that there are there is more than one race, i.e. that we are kind of se- a species separated by race, is very racist. It's a really horrible idea. You know, that, that we teach our children that, um, well, probably we don't say these sort of things anymore, but when I was a bit younger, you'd say, we're all the same colour on the inside. You know, we're all the same on the inside. So when it comes to race, uh, which is absolutely categorically correct, but uh, we're not the same in the inside if we're male and female. <laughs> We're absolutely not the same in the in- on the inside. To be clear, you're not saying that uh, women inherently have to like uh, um, makeup. And no. So what would you say a, a little boy who likes to wear frilly clothes and likes to um, and likes to listen to Beyonce, to go back mm-hmm. to that, Mm. Um, what would you say should, should, should happen to that little boy? Absolutely nothing. He should be allowed to wear what he wants. I mean, my, uh, I probably don't want to talk too much about my own children, but, um, one of my children, when he was, uh, nine, wanted to wear a headband to school. Now, it happened to be his sister's headband. And I said, you can wear it. Of course you can wear it. It's only clothes and a girl would wear it and you're more than welcome to wear it. However, you may well find that the boys in your class don't like it. I said, there's two ways to go with that. Either think, I don't care and I'm going to wear it regardless, or I do care and I'd probably not rather stick out. Now, I was the little girl that would have worn it. Come hell or high water, I quite liked being different. I liked being noticed, whether that was for positive or negative. I just, that I am that woman. But my son wasn't, and so he stopped. That that was a hundred percent his choice. But we don't, you know. There's, I guess, there's no. It's not a hundred percent his choice because there is no such thing as a free choice when you live in a society because you're always going to get judged. But you have to decide whether what your own impulse is asking you to do is is stronger than the reaction you get for doing whatever that is. So a little a little girl who likes to fix bicycles and when she's mm. a little older fix fix cars mm. is that doesn't mean she's a little boy. What that means is she is a little girl who should be loved for fixing bicycles and cars. Mm. Well, I you see the thing is I grew up and I'm sure you did too in an age where you could fix your own cars. So I did used to dry my points and I did used to uh do things to my engine and I had a tiny little Mini Cooper, and so I did fix cars, but I did that with a lot of makeup. Um, and I married a man who's probably a lot more um, tactile with our children, and I'm quite hard uh, emotionally. I mean, I'm not because I cry at adverts for God's sake. But when it comes to expectations, my husband's much tidier than me and a, an incredible chef, uh, and I'm <laughs> I'm really untidy. And um I don't I'm I'm not a very good if if we want to go down the stereotypes, I look like the stereotype of a woman, but that about that's about as far as it goes. Because I am not remotely female. I, I'm very direct, which women generally find quite difficult. 
because uh, I just I'd rather have one slightly tricky conversation than seven that get nowhere. So I'm not particularly female in the way I behave. But um, that's so another. Ob- so you're obviously a man. I believe so. The four children I've given birth to, I think, may <laughs> may decide that I'm not. But um. Oh, you're yes. reducing yourself to your genitals. There I you go. Can. Well, my uterus mainly. So, um, so, <laughs> so we just have a couple minutes left, and yeah. one thing can you mention is you're doing uh, is can you talk about about your U.S. trip, yeah. and then and then and then I'll ask you some sort of wind down. Okay. So uh, on the 25th, I'm flying out to Washington to start a week that we're calling Women Stand Up, which is a global. It's really just a global push. I don't want to lead a movement at all. And the women I'm uh, fixing up with, we're not seeking to lead women. We are. We just want women to start doing mini actions, whether it's something like writing to your MP or writing to your senator or governor, uh, about going and seeing your children's school, looking at their trans policies, find out how they're safeguarding impacts girls um, and children in general. You know, boys like their privacy too, away from girls. So, um, oh, 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 I want to say one thing about that, which is that the puberty was just horrifying. And it was, I got to tell you, boys' locker rooms were scary enough and it, 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 without, without the presence of females in the room. It, 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 I'm by scary, I just mean we are all so awkward about our bodies and we're mm-hmm. all so uncomfortable that if you throw a female into that room, and I'm not talking at this moment about her her safety or anything. I'm not saying necessarily that something bad would happen to her. What I'm saying is that it would be just awkward and uncomfortable for everyone. Well, it's just unfair. I mean, no child absolutely loves puberty. It's a balance every day of of feeling embarrassed and awkward, but also wanting independence from your parents. Um, and Sarah, Dr. Sarah Jane Blackmore or Blakemore does some amazing work on this. I, I implore you to look her up and listen to her work on adolescence. Um, but my sons don't want girls in their changing rooms. In fact, there is a girl that's insisting at one of my children's schools uh, that she plays with the boys. And already the boys in that year have said, if she is allowed to play rugby with the boys, they will protest and they will not participate in their PE lessons. So I, I kind of hope that happens <laughs> because I think it would be, it would be very good if boys actually said, no, hang on a minute. Uh, we, we're not taking that. Uh, Cause girls don't seem to be listened to. They, they, they just aren't on our schools are an absolute sham when it comes to safeguarding. So I, I interrupted you. I'm sorry. So go ahead about the, 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 you want women to stand up. Yeah. So we, it's called women stand up. Uh, we have movements going on in Canada, all across the UK, Australia, New Zealand, Germany, France, um, Ireland. And what they're doing is mini acts or big acts getting together using the hashtag women stand up. I myself are going out to America and on the 27th, we are having a panel discussion with Jamil Bay, who's uh, sort of a media, uh, a known media uh, personality in New York. Uh, Megan Murphy, who has famously been banned from Twitter for hate speech, and she's having a dreadful time in Canada. Uh, myself, I'll be chairing, and we have Cara Dansky and Bree Jontry of Fourth, Fourth Wave Now. So we're doing a panel discussion. Then we've got Dr. Julia Long and Julia Beck, um, amongst others, who are hosting sort of lesbian erasure panel discussions. All will be live streamed. We're hoping to have some, in fact, we have got some, really good meetings with quite influential people uh, whilst we're out there. But it just really is something where we say to women, we are not going to tell you what to do, but please do something. And where is this? Everywhere. So we're going to be in Washington, D.C. And Uh, people can find out like exactly when and where by looking. Is there someplace online they can look? There is. There's an event, right? We can't, we can never release the exact place, but, um, I think upon the Eventbrite, it's called We Need to Talk About Social Media. So it's on my page. So it's on Standing for Women on Facebook or standingforwomen.com. Um, I'll put a link as soon as I get off, actually. Um, so those those will be available. And it's one, 
I think we start one till three is the is the panel discussion with a bit of Q and A, and then we're doing um you know we'll have a social and things. So this is not the wind down question. We are running out of time, but I have to ask you this. You know, I have received death threats. So many women I know who work on these issues routinely receive uh, rape and death threats. Have, have you been threatened over this? I Well, I've had a, a website devoted to me and my children and, um, you know, saying things like intimate pictures of Posey Parker, which is when I've not long given birth to one of my children. So somebody stole lots of pictures of me. Um, and my kids and where we live and what school my children go to and what my husband looks like and how much we pay for our house. Um, but I, I've had a few hate things, but I'm, I haven't had rape and death threats. I mean, I have in my life because I'm a female online, so I certainly have. Um, but I haven't really had that many threats. I just routinely get called all sorts of names. Um, but I'm surprised that some of the stuff that hasn't happened to me, but then I, I don't, I'm not sure I care so much if it, if it did. I, I haven't got time for these things. I, I was a long time at school and I refuse to go back to the time where, uh, people can, you know, bully you like, uh, like we're kids. So. You've said that you want women to do to do their own actions. The, the last question for like thirty seconds: What do you want? What do you want people to take away from this interview? And what do you want people to take away from your billboard slash shirt campaign? Um, well, I was just a mother of four at home, and the reason I'm in the spotlight is because I was reported to the police for uh, some tweets. And I think anybody can do something, but you really do have to do something. Doing nothing is no longer an option. You have to just get off your ass and write a letter, make a comment, share an article, tell a friend. It doesn't really matter because in an instant, our rights will have just vanished and and people won't know how. And it will be because so many people stayed silent. Well, thank you so much for your work in the world, and thank you so much for being on the program. I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Posey Parker. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.